Um, so as I was saying, um, this painting takes viewers back to 1862 Battle of Antietam um, during the Civil War. And this conflict was a major turning point in the war um, where President Lincoln allowed African-Americans to join and fight with the Union Army, um, which resulted in um, victory for the Union, uh, eventually winning the Civil War and gaining emancipation for African-Americans. Um, and this painting is a collaboration between Moore and fellow artist and friend, Mark Thomas Gibson. And uh, the painting was inspired by Gibson's um, sketch, Battle of Antietam. And um, eventually it became a more of a call and response relationship, um, which resulted in uh, Mario's painting during and after the battle. Uh, so this exhibition will be on view at the museum through October 23rd, 2022. And uh, this painting during and after the battle is actually in the LSU Museum of Art's permanent collection and was acquired by funds with the from the Winifred and Kevin P. Riley Initiative for Underrepresented Artists. And um, we would also like to thank our members, visitors, and donors to the annual exhibition fund. So um, I'll just start a little bit by talking about our artists that are here, our guests. So Mario Moore um, lives and works in Detroit, Michigan, um, and received his BFA in illustration from the College of Creative Studies and MFA in painting from the Yale School of Art. He has been awarded the prestigious Princeton Potter Fellowship and has participated as an artist in residence at Knox College, Duke University, Fountainhead Residency, and the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. In 2021, he had his first museum survey exhibition enshrined presence and preservation at the Charles H. Wright Museum of Detroit. Um, and the show is currently at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. Mark Thomas Gibson, uh, personal lens on American culture stems from his multifaceted viewpoint as an artist, as a black male, a professor, and an American history buff. Um, these myriad and often colliding perspectives fuel his exploration of contemporary culture through languages of drawing, painting, print, and sculpture, revealing a vision of satirical dystopian America where every viewer is implicated as a potential character within the story. Uh, Mark received his BFA from the Cooper Union and his MFA from the Yale School of Art, and he is represented by MMB in Los Angeles and Loyal in Stockholm. Okay, so um, to get into the question, thank you both for being here this evening, so excited to have you both here. Um, I just want to um, start off by asking, so are both of you actually in your studios today, as I'm seeing. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> been here always, and I'm sure that's the same for Mark. Yeah. That's just possible, every day if I can. So, um, so both of you um, went to the Yale School of Art. Just kind of give us a brief introduction of, of how you both met and kind of started working together as artists. Hmm. Who wants to go rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> yeah, I'll let, I'll, let you, I'll let you go first. Well, I'll, I'll tell a bit and then you tell the other bits. Okay. So, um, so I met Mario during the day where I went to go uh, apply. I mean, I went to go for my interview. That's the first time I met Mario. And it was like, I met this guy, he's smiling, and he's extremely nice and gregarious. And I'm like, oh, that's the game he's playing. Because <laughs> you never know in these kind of, those kind of spaces. And there's a lot of tension, and there's a lot of stress, and there's a lot of, you know, people, some people have different um, understandings of where, a different understanding of where they're at that moment. And so the stakes can be extremely high for some, and maybe not so much for others. But so the energy is very complicated. But I was there with a friend. He was talking to John Slaza, I think, at the time, the first time I ran into you, standing outside the pit. And we're like um, up above and we're like looking down. But it was strange in that moment 
because I was like, okay, I'm gonna know this person. And it was just like, it didn't even seem like, it was just like, that felt like a very natural, the three of us or that space felt very natural in the moment. But um, yeah, we both get in, we get to know each other a bit. I get to see, I mean, it's, it's weird because I felt like in school, we both were so dedicated almost in our work and our processes that really the friendship and maybe even getting to know each other better came a lot more after school. Absolutely. And um, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, so I, I remember the, the, you know, the first time that I met Mark, I mean, it was the day of the interview, you know, Yale, you, you, there's this two-step process. So basically you apply, you hope you get, you know, all the way through, you hope you get through step one and then step two, you have to bring your artwork or back then you had to bring your physical artwork and then you had an um, interview with uh, people from the school. Now, I think what's interesting about me is that I'm coming from the Midwest. Um, so a lot of the artists who were there during that interview, or including Mark, um, knew a lot about the contemporary art world. I had ideas and concepts about the contemporary art world, but um, I didn't know much. So when I came to the interview, you know, I was coming to, you know, you know I'm thinking Yale in parentheses. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm dressed up. I have a, like a, a, I think a button down shirt, some slacks, some nice shoes. I meet Mark and I, I meet um, John Slaza. John Slaza looks like a skateboarder. You know, he's just got like, it's <laughs> like gym shoes yeah. on. Mark is put together. Um, but I was one put thing together. About, now you remember that. Okay. Yeah, Don't yeah. Mark was definitely put together. Right. Mark was put All together. Right. But what I do remember is I was like, okay, Mark knows exactly what he's talking about. Like he, like I was like, he is a very intelligent person. And oh, I was like, you. me going into this interview, I have no idea what's going on. I was like, I was totally lost. I had no clue about any of the people that were going to be interviewing me, mm. um, what their work looked like, if they were important artists or not. So my my assumptions going in was a very innocent one. It was it was very much like okay, I'm gonna go in here and talk about my work, and we'll see what happens. I feel like Mark knew about the people that he was going to be talking to. I feel like, uh -uh. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, you I didn't. didn't. I, I feel went, like you did, no, man. No, I went in and I and like I checked in to see who was there, and then I went over to the library to look at art and try to breathe, and then I like and then I looked them up, <laughs> and it did some wow. research. And like, no, because honestly, I, I know this sounds crazy. I never really thought about it. Like what Yale mm -hmm. meant. I didn't know the history of it, really. I hadn't really clocked it. I had quit making art until about two, one to two years before I applied. Yeah. And so I had kind of actually been out of the game and had kind of wow. been out of like just the knowledge of things. But in that moment, I kind of was like, I remember getting on the shuttle going into the campus and then kind of looking around going, oh, this one's serious. <laughs> like, like I'm happy. I, I'm happy I wore this this jacket. This, exactly, this jacket, exactly, you know? exactly. <laughs> you can never dress up too much, right? So yeah, like, no, absolutely. But after, like, so after the interview, and, and I remember hanging out in the pit and like you know just talking yeah. about this whole experience. I, yeah. Um, but I remember during this, like the the years in school, I would just you know go talk to Mark, and I I didn't go into Mark's studio often, but when I did, or he came to my studio. Like uh, we we would have these incredible conversations, and I just I just was like really amazed at how much information he stored in his brain, because mm. <laughs> he would he would just he was just spewing out this history, and we would just we would just talk about art, um, and that yeah. definitely grew, especially after um, yeah after college, for sure. And you know, and I definitely think in college there was a moment where we were looking at something or crit you sure referencing some like some Rembrandt plant. And it was like, but you were talking about it, how it was made. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, oh, like this is the depth. Like this is these other parts of his making that we haven't really seen here in this space yet. Mm -hmm. And and that was the stuff that we kind of started having more conversations about once we were in the real world, back in the real world. Um, and, and, and trying to figure out how to live in the real world. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Wow, that's such an interesting story. Um, so, Mario, so when you were researching the Battle of Antietam for your painting, um, why did you ask Mark to collaborate with you? Or was he the first person in your mind to, to go to for this project? Yeah, you know, I, I think 
you know, the art world is weird. <laughs> the art world is weird. The art world is selfish. Um, artists are selfish. Uh, I can admit that sometimes, definitely. But mm -hmm. in my mind, I was thinking about this idea because um, I was doing a lot of research about my family history. Um, I was really focused on the contemporary moment uh, because the exhibition uh, where this where this painting uh, show was all planned around um, the election date. It was supposed to happen, you know, during the election, the presidential election. And a lot of the things that we were going through were very similarly uh, or similar historically to uh, what was happening before the Civil War. All mm -hmm. the, the, the different opinions that were clashing together that created that explosion um, in America. Um, so that's really what led me into the research. And I started to think about doing a portrait of Mark. I mean, that was a general idea, really. It was like, man, I want to do a painting of Mark. And, and that really came from me just knowing Mark and how interested he is in American history specifically, you know, and also history in general. But I was a little nervous coming to him with the idea, right? Because I think oftentimes when you see an artist that paints another artist, you know, they might paint them in their studio or they might create something and then they just recreate whatever's in that space. So for me, because I knew that Mark loves history as much as I do, and we would, you know, go to the Met and we would look at all these kind of historical yeah. paintings. I was like, you know, maybe I'll, I'll give this a bite and see if this is some th something he's interested in. So I asked, I was like, hey, man, I got this crazy idea, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, would you like, can I do a portrait of you? And then the painting that's going to be on the wall, I want to do this piece about Antietam, you know, and I was talking about this battle. And I was like, I would love for you to do a drawing. And then based on the work that we like, you know, these historical paintings, I want to do a painting based off of that drawing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I was just, I was just kind of waiting to see what he would say. And, and then ultimately he was like, oh yeah, for sure. And, and I think that just led to a really great um, uh, creative project that, that benefited us both, right? Because mm -hmm. I think when you collaborate with another creative mind, that you start to see things in ways that you didn't think about before. Um, Absolutely. So that really opened me up to think about what could happen within this composition in a very different way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I took it as an opportunity to have, be in dialogue with Mario in the way that he thinks, and I know that we're... I see his strengths and I, where I can see my weaknesses. And I was like, let's see if we can like push off of each other a bit. And like, and then in a way in which I don't think that just simply having a conversation could do, but Absolutely. really having a conversation in the making and the watching and the observing of another person's like hands. And, um, and because I think when we talk about work and we usually get giddy and we get really excited and we're like telling each other about something, we start talking about like the touch, we start talking about the light, we start talking about the color, we start talking about the moments that things that hit and like add up. And so when I did it, the drawing that I thought of, I was like, okay, I've been in this weird place where I've been drawing a lot of these explosive little fighting scenes or whatever. And I was like, okay, you're giving me a fighting scene. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make it tricky for you. I'm gonna like make it so that like it's hard to tell where bodies are coming from and what things are going on. I'm gonna make you have to rethink the space. And so I did that and I was like, okay, I got him. <laughs> and so then he comes back with this like trench scene, you know, and I and I like I realized I kind of gave it to him a little bit, but then he really had taken it and he like made this into like, you know, and I actually had gone back and I'd read about the battle and I thought about the different forms of warfare that were happening during that battle and what kind of weaponry was there and what was available during that battle. Because a lot of innovation happens during the Civil War as far as materials, as far as clothing. I mean, the first outfits that the Union have are like made by um, Brooks Brothers. And they were using like swept up material from the ground. Now, mind you, Brooklyn has also made like outfits for slaves too. But they, <laughs> but they, they made they would just take the leaving and they would kind of make this gluey kind of face. And they would have these suits that when people would march, if it was if it got too sweaty, the clothing would fall apart, or mm -hmm. if it rained, it would just fall apart. But then we're talking about a different period in the conflict where that that is not no longer so much the case. So I mean, just thinking about little details like that and then making the image. And then when I got to see what Mario was clicking on the other side, I was like, oh man, okay. <laughs> and so that's what that's what gave me the desire then to like make the larger painting, my own version, 
which then breaks how the read of time in these two works and as they relate to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the strangeness of it, of, of it, it didn't need to follow a prescriptive ending and how we would arrive at the works. And it wasn't even the idea that there'd even be two works. I never even thought about ever really showing my piece with this piece. It was just simply like conversation from a distance. And I was like, oh, I like what you, how you did that. Let me see if I can do something with that. And, um, and at the time I've been painting predominantly black and white and it, it remained black and white for a very long time until I decided to go back in and color it because I had to really think about that division of color and what all the different representations of um, both sides in that argument, in that civil war, uh, it was necessary not to just leave it blank, you know. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am gonna, I'm gonna say, um, for those of you watching, please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we're talking. So once we get to that point, we can just start going with those questions. Um, but I did want to, I'm going to share my screen um, so we can, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit, you can see, um, you can see the slides. I've never, now I'll say this about my self portrait. I have never had my family call me to talk about a painting before. <laughs> 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 people keep, keep passing that photo around, aunts and cousins, and people wow. calling me up. Like, wow. I was like, that's, that's you? That's you? <laughs> Give me that. I'm like, I didn't make that. <laughs> All right. So, you know, what, what I also love about Mark, as everybody watching can see, is how much information this guy just stores. I don't know where it goes, but he just has it, you know? And I think that was so important for me in thinking about who um, I wanted to paint, why I wanted to paint them, and how I, I saw, you know, what the possibilities were with, with this painting. And, and, and Mark, you know, when he did his initial, um, you know, small, small, small drawing, it really blew me away. And then, and then I was like, damn, okay, what am I, <laughs> how am I supposed to interpret this, right? Because that's the, what you're showing right now is the drawing that Mark did after I talked to him about the piece, right? So initially for this whole thing, I had a, I went to Mark's studio, I took a photograph of him um, sitting in his studio. So I had an idea of the format, right? But I wanted the composition to work. So I had no idea what Mark would do for that frame that was gonna sit behind him, right? So I had to take this information that he gave me and then I, I had to decipher it. Now, what was difficult about deciphering this is as you can see, everybody's covered in smoke. So, so through this challenge that Mark gave me, right? And I was like, oh, Mark, okay, here you go. I, I, ha I, I had to kind of create the, the narration that would come out of what Mark created. So this is my response to, to what he made. And, um, you know, so a, a great surprise to me is that after I finished, you know, the painting and the work, then, then Mark went back and he wanted to respond to that work. And I think it, it's just something, um, this whole process has been something that's just been very natural, right? A very mm -hmm. organic kind of um, relationship and collaboration. Um, and, and, a, and a lot of times, like I, like I said at the beginning, that artists are selfish, right? And when you, when you talk about collaborations, um, I mean, even you can think about, you know, something that's more specific, right? And of course, they're working on top of each other. But like, you know, Andy Warhol and John Michel Basquiat, right? Like, it, it was this idea, I think, for both of them that they were kind of working on top of each other's work, right? Parsing out something and then working on top of that. And I think in this way, this was uh, really generative, right? Because it's allowing both of us to um, express ourselves in the way that, that we're familiar with, but also challenge our studio practice in ways um, that we, like, I mean, especially for me, I didn't think about before, right? Um, I mean, I'm not going to look at a drawing that pushes outward 
that's filled and titled with smoke, but you can understand the narrative within that work, right? Mm -hmm. So from that, I had to really figure out like, what is Mark thinking about here? And how do I transform this into the way that I think? Um, so yeah, it's just really, uh, uh, I think a, a great experience. Yeah, it, it really had me, um, it had me have to slow down and it had me, it, it made me have to think about like the reason why I think we were able to like kind of communicate the way we, we did is because we both have some, and this is maybe for the students in the room, um, just to know history and to know what someone is even signaling by what they're offering to you in this game. Because there was things that I did to Mario that I didn't verbalize to him. But when he showed up, he knew that I was playing certain games with him. Yep. So I made sure like I was wearing black leather boots sitting in a black leather chair, but they're two different leathers. Like I had my dog with me, but he's also wearing like a little sweater, like a red and blue sweater. So like doing that work of like, he's gonna have to paint leather, he's gonna have to paint jean, he's gonna have to paint my jacket, my hoodie, which is different. He's gonna have to paint a metal chair with like a, a ceramic vase with flowers. Like all of those things have different technical touch. And I made sure that I had positioned myself so that little like light situation that's back there, those wires would be there. So we'd have to do all that shadow. <laughs> and to my surprise, he met it. He like went there. Yep. It was like that, it was an un, it was an unsaid thing of like, here we go. Like, can you do it? Like it's almost like the dozens or something, like kind of like, and what? Like, what do you got? And then yep. he came back at me and I was like, oh man. And I remember like going to my wife. <laughs> And showing him that leather chair and that edge, I'm like, look at that. He figured it out. He figured it out. And uh, but then to also do the flesh and the hands, like the, these are the things that, when looking at masterful painting of a Western canon, we do tend to look at these things and like, you know, it's like Rubens. You know, like mm -hmm. how could he paint like metal bu a button next to a fabric that had hair on it, and then paint a beard and then paint the flesh of a person and they have a, you know, just like all that kind of happening in harmony and color and light all together in rhythm. That is actually some of the things that when you're making a painting, that's what it can be of high consideration. Um, and I, but when it's, when it marries like this, like to, and a white wall, exactly, to yeah. a white wall and not let it go dead it's, and become uninteresting. Hard. That is hard. You have to come up with a right little bit of warmth in there so it doesn't pop up too hard, so it doesn't go flat, but it has to be alive. It no. can't just be like straight out to like lead white. That's not going to work. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah. another thing I think that I thought about in your, your drawing was how the battle was pushed so close to the viewer in that mm -hmm. initial drawing. And it was like, okay, he's doing that. So I also want Mark and the painting behind him, even though there's a little distance, I want the painting to feel like it's almost on the, the same linear field as you are, even though figuratively speaking, it's behind you, right? I want to push everything forward mm -hmm. like your mm -hmm. piece was. Um, so I think um, even in, in little notations like that, it's a way uh, to respond to one another, right? And, and kind of create this, this great back and forth. There's a triangle composition that kind of okay stop, but <laughs> get into this. But like so, because of the way that the the step la the step ladder is, and if you look at the way the couch is, I mean the the chairman, there's a little bit of a one point perspective game. It's it's like a fake. It's overdone maybe, but it's a little bit that yeah. going there. But if you go to the painting in the back, the guy's knee in the foreground that creates a triangle. Yep. So there's like certain things compositionally that are happening here. If you look, if you find them, like even what's happening with the two flags that are, it's like you start getting an, a little bit of an X composition, but it's sitting in, a, in an asymmetrical place on the painting. Mm -hmm. So I, also I taught um, today. So my brain is like <laughs> a little bit like instructory. Sorry. <laughs> but like, these are the things that like I look at and I, and I kind of respond to, and then when I started working on my painting, I was like, okay, I haven't played with the history painting um, in this way. 
And so I have to think about history painting from that, that perspective of history, especially the difference between an American history painting and let's say a European history painting. Because an American history painting is a technique that's being, that, that, that people are going over maybe to Europe or maybe they've seen drawings from Europe, but they don't really, it's, it's a different thing. It's like a, it's a watered down kind of mm -hmm. version of it. But when you're in Europe and you have to see like massive history paintings or if you see something like the Rafa Medusa or something like that, you know, like it's a completely different animal and, and different things, different stakes in the way it's painted. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to, to interject. I just want to listen to you guys talk. Um, but um, I'm going to, let's see. I wanted to, you, you all started talking about your different styles of painting. So I did want to bring up, um, I know Mario mentioned, you all used to see um, Peter Paul Rubens and his, um, his paintings at, at the Metropolitan Museum. So here's an example of one in also some images of um, some battle scene sketches, but also some photography um, from that battle. So as far as your, um, as far as your sketches, was that something that was deliberate for both of you? Because they are somewhat similar to the style of sketches that were um, happening, you know, during these battles um, and of course, the um, Peter Paul Rubens painting. Um, Wolf Hunt, yeah. I know that's just one artist, but um, mm -hmm. what other um, what other artists and um, techniques were you all um, inspired by to to do this work? You want to go first? I mean, I could talk about the Wolf Hunt. Okay. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> okay, the Wolf Hunt was one of my favorite paintings for a long time at, at the Met. And it's in a crazy Rubens painting. It's definitely made coming out of his studio, which is like assistants working on it. So there's parts of this painting that run extremely flat, kind of under, like not poorly painted, I guess you could say. But you could see where Rubens kind of comes in with the two heads of the two wolves. It's like the head of the wolf that's on the top, it almost seems like if you really think about the neck and the twist and the length of it, it's almost like it's, it doesn't make sense really. But it's like, if you believe it, when you get to the action, you actually see those two wolves heads. It's incredible. But the the way I would say when I was building that smoke and fog, like this type of painting um, would be a good example because I would say I would try to make where the foot is coming from, like you're seeing the bottom of it, and then it's like arcing back. It implies different spaces and different depths mm -hmm. like what's happening with an arm is it's coming over it's implying that a body is doing certain things so as long as i'm kind of doing that game decent enough mario has something to play off of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it's like it's about like but also i'm trying to also as much as i may all talk about the game of creating um roadblocks for for the way i'm thinking about it too is that those roadblocks also offer opportunity Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like, and that's the way I think that that's a healthy way that the game is played between the two of us when we're doing this. It's like, I'm like, okay, I see that. I see that little thing that you did with that foot. Okay, I see where you put that person. Oh, you had a battlefield in the background with some other, okay. Yeah. All right, so you, so I'm going frontal, you're going deep space. Okay. Yep, exactly. You know? I think, um, you know, to think about you know, this source and and as I talked about it, um, you know, with Mark and and when we would go to the Met, we would look at this painting a lot, you know. I mean, it's it's just the fur, the the way the foxes are 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 painted and the way the wolves are painted, right? You can really tell that there is a very specific hand at play. Um, it's a level of mastery there uh, that you you kind of don't see anywhere else within the painting. You know, so it's 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 it has this uh, specificity that I think in one was like, oh man, that's like that's just really beautiful, and then like I want to one day kind of do something like that. So for me, my my notations were okay. Mark is providing me with a with a scaffolding. I have to respond to this, right? But I'm also thinking about um, uh, American Civil War paintings as well. I'm thinking about Winslow Homer. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about, um, let's see, uh, Frederick Church. I'm thinking about a lot of these deep paintings 
Um, and oddly enough, I'm, I'm always thinking about Velasquez. I can't get I can't get Velasquez out of my head. So when I'm thinking about that deep space, right? It's the idea of this, you know, the Battle of Antietam being the most deadliest battle in America, right? Um, I mean, you know, the Union won, right? And I say that in parentheses because mm-hmm. so many people died on both sides, right? It was just enough win for um, for for Lincoln to you know declare what he did, but that expansiveness of of that kind of battle scene, I wanted to uh, push the kind of background further back to kind of focus more on the deep space also, right? Even if it's just like an implication or implying that something else is going on. Mm-hmm. No, that deep space I think is re- really important because it makes you understand the scope of the of the battle that is happening. And, oh, because I remember even reading about it, how the battle like, was happening in multiple places. And there's like, mm-hmm. so like fight over bridge, of course, you know, and there's all these different things that are, these events that are happening in taking place. And so when you read it, you start to realize how dire that moment actually was. And I think this painting in this activity I did with you later led me into making an insurrection painting when that mm-hmm. actually occurred. But I feel like this painting, we were talking about, like what we were talking about, like when we were in the studio talking about it, like this is what's going to happen. Like yep. this is what these schools are playing with and they're, and, they're, and they're acting like this isn't what's really at stake here. But this is what's actually at stake and still is at stake. Absolutely. And so that's what makes sometimes history painting so significant. It's not just simply that that painting was painted at the time and then we all look back and say, oh, and all these other things are happening is that they're trying to still tell us things about today and about the dynamics of our people and what's happening inside of our culture and how we need to like look at it and do something about it. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Let's see. I just wanted to go through. Mm. Everyone can see the images very quickly. Like that was shocking to me to see that. Mm. Uh, and I think you 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 brought up a good point in that, you know, what we were talking about. I mean, I, and I think that's because we we love history, we read a lot of history. We were like, this is going to happen. You know, mm-hmm. we it's like the the work that we created was about what we knew was what was coming. We knew mm-hmm. that the insurrection was coming. We knew January sixth was coming. It was just, mm-hmm. it was really just a matter of time, right? And there's still these possibilities of things mm-hmm. that are happening at the moment and um, and continue to happen. So I think, uh, you know, what Mark and I did was kind of uh, at one point create a mark in time, right? Create a space in time to talk about these things that we kind of knew what was coming because I think we are really in depth with history and we know that history repeats itself, especially when we don't pay attention to it. Um, and that it's also about this idea of, uh, you know, possibilities, like what can painting do on the, on its kind of physical, um, uh, kind of occulative level, like how can you make something interesting, right? And how can you mm-hmm. push it forward um, so that it continues to be a conversation? Right? It, does it, it doesn't become something that's dead or it doesn't become something that people are tired of looking at, right? Because that's, that's, we, that's what we're doing here, right? Yeah. We want people to come and, and look and pay attention. Mm-hmm. And then like there's things that I think about when, about slowing people down and like having a certain little things and, and hidden things in there that like people maybe don't get. But like in the original drawing, there's a sun on one side and there's the moon on the other. And I actually was like kind of thinking a lot about what you see that in like imagery about the deluge mm-hmm. and about like something like big, biblical, something like massive, something that the heavens or the universe like recognizes as being significant. And um, I think a lot about that right now in this moment that we're living through and the work that we're making is that there is certain still to this day, even though like how what the subject matter of, of my of our work is that there's always maybe some of the, 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 the elements of, um, let's say, figuration or like portraiture or 
uh, landscape or my side cartooning and kind of satire. But then there's like, when we have the conversation about what's really behind the work, we're talking about capitalism or we're talking about mm-hmm. economic disparity or we're talking about all of these other elements of things that are part of our real every day. Because our job as artists is to document the life that we're living today. Mm-hmm. It's not simply just to go back and look at history and go like, but I want to make something like that. You know, it's not <laughs> about that. Yep. It's really not. It yep. wouldn't have any teeth. It wouldn't have any staying power otherwise. I don't think that, honestly, that though that painting of, of me in front of that, it's a beautifully rendered painting, is gorgeous to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, shocking for me because I've never felt like I've ever been um, depicted that way, and really. And um, But at the same time, it has the, the his that teeth, that little that teeth that's there and that's necessary. That's what latches on. That's what actually stays. And I implore all artists, if this is your voice, if that's if you feel like you have that in your voice, to employ that. Not everyone has that, so not everyone has to. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to say falsify yourself, but I'm saying if you have that, join us because we need you. Exactly. Thank you. So um, I'm going to read a couple questions from the chat. Um, I believe this question is for Mark. Um, it says, the comic angle is such a pleasant but unexpected element. Can you speak more about that influence? Um, so my influence in comics, it's, it's kind of complicated because it's one that grew out of, um, I had a gut feeling and my response when looking at a lot of comic imagery that there was a lot of subtext there. And uh, I would look at it and I'm like, huh, they're trying to say something about this, you know? And it wasn't just because it was like a mad magazine or something. It was like, I could see it. Like even in like, a, like a, an 80s Marvel comic, like there'd be stuff about drugs, there'd be something about crime, there'd be something about the city. And then I have to think about the racialization of certain characters that they're depicting inside of that space. Like I was, I was already, when you're a person of color and you see comics, you read comics a little differently. You get right to it, I think. But that said, I didn't really realize that, you know, there was an honor domie. I did not realize there was a la cigarette. I did not understand that there was a punch. I didn't understand that there were um, people who had made political contributions through their making and caricature and comics. And as I got older and as I started looking at people who were political activists, socialists, or if they were like people like Diego Rivera, if there were people like you know Charles White, or people like who are making work, and Philip Dustin, who are making work that is political, that is active, that it has a, like what we consider today a cartoony gesture to it. Mm-hmm. But then those, if you look at muralism paintings, that's like you know, a muralist from that era. That's definitely that hand, and it's about a hand that can communicate without words. That when you can see a person and the way that they look fraught. And the way they look upset and when they look internalized, like learning to depict something like that, I was interested in. I only saw, and the reason why I think I go towards like maybe some Michelangelo um, or maybe more so Rubens, because Rubens does that to his people. He makes them go through that. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, okay, so this next question is for both of you. Um, has this collaboration experience given you? the interest to pursue other collaborations with individual artists? And if so, can you tell us what what are you dreaming about or what are you pursuing? Um, I can definitely say it it has for me, Um, just from from this one um, collaboration call and response with Mark, uh, I think for my show, I started to think about other ways in which I could work with somebody that's really good at something that complements my ideas. Like in particular, I worked with another artist, uh, uh, his name is Jason Patterson. I believe he's in Maryland now, but he makes, I mean, he makes the most beautiful frames I have ever seen. And he doesn't think he does, right? Uh, Because he he works with a, a, a master woodsman um but he also makes these pastel paintings and they look they really look like paintings uh but they're in pastel uh but for me it's like he he's also a historical person so he's thinking about a lot a lot of american history um but the way that he creates his frames really puts the work in a certain context 
So I worked with him um, on that uh, for my, my show in, in uh, New Orleans. And also collaborated with a writer on, um, on a project right now. I'm, I'm working with my mom and she's doing some uh, gold thread sewing on these large silver point drawings. Um, and me and Mark have been talking. We've both been crazy busy, but we have this yeah. like, another collaboration. It's just, it's really just a matter in time. Yeah, I, I think that the one, I, I think I haven't really picked up another collaboration with somebody else because I've been stoked about this one in particular. <laughs> but I know that it's like the idea that I have, the way that I kind of see my first volley at Mario, I have some tricks. I got some, I, I see that he's been picking up like with the water and all this stuff. I don't know. I could have told him what it was going to be about. So I'm like, is he like lifting weights in these new things? <laughs> like getting prepared for what I'm about to throw at him? But I, you know, in the past, I have um, with my wife, we, the artist Katie Gegenheimer, we did a collaboration together, which I think was really fruitful. Um, a series of drawings that I kind of think we should go back into and, and, and go deeper with that. And I have worked and collaborated with people, but it's always been a, a what happened in the case here was a surprise mm -hmm. that I, I, I don't want to duplicate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't think that's the spirit of what I like, you know, it's a very particular animal and it's, yeah. and I do think it could generate some cool things down the road, but like, like, like how that first one came about, it has to, it will be right. I think it will come together like that, you know? Yeah. Okay, so just one more question here. Um, it seems like so much of the rich, richness of this collab comes from your own interests and talents, but are there other aspects of a call and response that can be a useful process for artists more generally? Hmm. Mm. Um, absolutely. I think. You know, when you think about the terms call and response, it, that, that's really coming from a, a very uh, traditional African uh, space. Um, and in that way, right, it's almost like you, you have the drummer and you have the dancer, right? The response from the dancer is initiated by the drummer. The dancer can't make a move, the drummer doesn't begin, right? The dancer won't know what to do unless they hear the sound. So I think in that way, as artists, um, as a call and response, right? Um, I mean, for me, I'm an observer of the world around me, right? Everything I take in, everything that I read, um, everything that's coming at me um, has a possibility to influence the things that I make. Um, so I, I think just as a visual person, if you you go and go outside and and you look around, you're going to respond to to what you see, um, and I, and I think oftentimes. You know, especially as a as a person that works in a fairly, I was I would say a traditional means, right? In a in a kind of realist means, right? I'm doing things with paint that you know you can't really be can't be seen through an image, uh, but in that way, what I'm responding to always has a kind of um, immediate kind of interaction with my mind and the beauty to it, right? Something that I can't replicate, right? I can go outside and look at clouds and be like, holy shit, those are the most amazing clouds I've ever seen in my life. Nobody can ever paint that. I don't care what painter you are, you're never mm -hmm. going to get there, you know? Um, but the influence and the response to that is that I'm trying to get to a place where I'm doing my own thing in response to what I see. Right. So I think that's just a natural way that, you know, you you um, a, an artist or a creative person can kind of go back and forth with, with what they see every day. Yeah, I tell people, at least like, and then looking at students and that, today, I've been thinking a lot about it was like how to slow down and how to actually look and how to actually look mm -hmm. and actually look at what you find is interesting, to like find out what's interesting there. And I had I'm cropping this drawing they did. And they didn't quite get it at first, but they, because it takes time yep. and it's like, and I think in this case of this, this game, it's like, we had two players who both do that work, who, who slow down and just look at stuff mm -hmm. and just slow down and said, I'm going to draw that table and, you know, just draw it and mm -hmm. toss it out, you know, just, just because I, I trust in the fact that when I draw something, it's the, my, um, 
hand-eye coordination, it gets kind of a little bit burnt in, and so it becomes a little bit of a signature, and it becomes a little bit apart. It becomes easier to access it. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that kind of work and you're observing all the time, it makes when you're looking for somebody else to work with or you see something in someone else's work, you know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And also this thing, and I think what what, what actually with Mario's, because I'm like I became allergic uh, at the beginning of uh, COVID to oil paint. Mm. So like, so I can't. I'll never go back. I can't really go back there again. Wow. So in some ways, I get to like see certain things that Mario's pulling off, and I get to enjoy it now. Mm. It's like there's like there's so much of like mm, I can't figure that out. It's like <laughs> it, it's a, it's more like I can figure. I might sit there and I can look at it, and I can I can figure it out in my brain, and I can enjoy looking at it. Like it's like reading a good book. It's like it's something that makes when you and it's like it's just appreciation yep. and that's why i think and that's where it kind of comes out of this game it, it comes out of this appreciation for one another and an appreciation that i don't think we had verbalized really to one another yep. and until we were actually sharing the work with each other did we actually start to offer that appreciation between each other Absolutely. and you know and that's and, and that to me that's why i say that this was like a special thing because it because it during COVID, during the world on fire and I'm going on fire and all this stuff, you know, we sitting there kind of going, Yeah, that's this is what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> this is this way this way it is, man. I don't know. <laughs> doing it it's getting this world doing it again. And like, but then go deeper. Yep. You know, vulnerability, that kind of thing. That's a there's a lot of vulnerability in this. There's a lot of time and trust. Because he has to put a lot of time to making that open. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's a lot of time and a lot of trust between the two of us that I'm not there to just thwart him, mm -hmm. but I'm there to support him. And that's a very different thing. Okay, we have one final question. Um, so this kind of references the, for both of you, like the battle scenes there depicted in this, Someone said a very, it's a very gruesome and kind of unsettling uh, manner with these, you know, decapitated bodies. So can you all speak to that? And I know it was deliberate, of course, but can you both speak to that in detail? Can I speak um, to her? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go then. I'll let I'll let uh, I'll let Mark take over. Um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, when talking about something like the Civil War, the deadliest battle um in america you know that war presented death to the country in a way that it never saw before right we're talking about a war that was um that happened that was using methods that were very old world british style war meaning you have troops that are following in a line along the way and they're meeting other troops that are following a line a long way. But you have weapons that are contemporary weapons. Some of the most deadly weapons that were ever used in war, right? Um, it's, it's really a, a space in between modern war and, and, and old English warfare, right? Um, and after this moment, then you have some of the first uh, war photographs ever. So a lot of these images were going across America and people looked at death very differently in the country from that point forward. So mm -hmm. you're talking about an entire change in the nation in the way that they see death, um, which was very gruesome. So it, it's, it's, it, it, comes with the, it comes with the history, you know? Yeah, it's true. And I mean, when the first battles of the Civil War, people showed up to picnic on the side because they just thought it was gonna be some little skirmish. And then bullets started flying, people started getting hit and they were like, what is this? And bullets like that, they run hot. And sometimes they actually like explode. And then you have viscera from another person that'd be hot and it would hit someone else's face and it would get stuck to their face. Mm -hmm. You have like people like losing limbs and things are getting blown off. But also you have like the first people like um, are doing amputation and actually people surviving that. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden then you have people who have lived and who are living, but no longer are, um, and are fully physically intact. Mm -hmm. and like and so all of this and people are seeing the relatives come back like that and now they have to figure out how to care for people like that the horror and the thing is that the horror is being done by people who might even be your relatives who might even be people that you knew before this war so it's like 
that kind of proximity and that kind of destruction and that kind of like violence up close. It's, you know, when we're thinking about the tier period of time when we're making this, you know, I could walk two blocks down, the, you know, three blocks down one way and there was protests going on. And there's like violence and there's activity and there's motion and there's all these things that are kind of occurring. That's, just, that's, it, that's what it was like for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, that was happening on their property. <laughs> like it was happening on their property. And uh, I think that we have fought so, for so many years, over 150, 160 years now, mm -hmm. um, where at a distance, and we've created a, a situation where our conflict is always at a distance. There was something I was listening today, because today is like the 100th anniversary of um, Howard Zinn. And um, Dr. Marcus out earlier, they had him talking, and he was talking about his time in the war and how he was part of the first, um, the first time they actually ever used napalm. He supposedly mm -hmm. was on those planes, and they bombed when they were bombing France in the last few days of the war, where they thought some Germans were. And he says, like, we're six miles up. We don't hear the screams. We don't know what's happening. We're at a distance. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yep. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. So when we think about history painting, especially in American context, there's a lot of gruesome things in a lot of American paintings that make it seem like it was just a simple treaty. <laughs> that was just somebody handing over a piece of paper and just saying, oh, thank you for your land. Yeah, <laughs> <That's laughs> a lot of things had to happen before you get you to that river. You know, so those are the things that I think that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, and I know Mario is always interested in unveiling. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you all so much for answering so many questions. Um, and this um, conversation has been um, so enlightening um, for a lot of us. I'm getting a lot in the chat. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone who um, who showed up this evening. Um, this chat, this um, sorry, um, this has been recorded, so it will be posted on our website um, after we do some editing, and um, you all be able to see it again. If you are in the Baton Rouge, New Orleans area, please come by the museum or at the Shaw Center downtown, and um, please see the exhibit. Um, thank you again to Mark and Mario for, for coming here and um, giving your time. I know you all are busy and have to get back to work. So uh, thank you so much. No, thank you. And thank you for doing this. And thank you for moderating this for the both of us and, and for bringing Mario's show and to the space. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Clark. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, LSU. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. All right. You guys right, have thank you. Okay. Bye. Talk to you later, Mario. Hello. All right, man. Peace. <laughs> Peace.